Welcome to all of it. We got all of it. All of it. <laughs> all of <laughs> it. <laughs> Our guest is Secretary Madeleine Albright, Brian Cranston, Tank and the Bangas, Barry Jenkins, Celia Keenan Bolger, Aaron Lee Carr, Esperanza Spalding, Gideon Glick, Helen Yoyemi, Fab Five Freddy, Benga Akanabi, Brene Brown, Tony Goldwyn, Tandy Newton, Jake Gyllenhaal. <laughs> Welcome to all of it. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. What a pleasure. Hi. Hi. This is so fun. I'll see you tomorrow. We're here every day, 12 to 2. The impromptu concert. I love it. I love it. I love it. I was there for the love of it. You must tell the truth. I'm sure everyone's perspective is unique. There's a lot of truth about the pain of being an immigrant, mm. but they're jokes. We find the funny. It's our strength. At what point do you think women's health care will stop being a political issue? When half of Congress can get pregnant. Ran out of words, but we do what we do. We mm. don't have no words, so we got to trade twos. So we trade twos, all this really dope groove. And Allison was so nice to meet you. <laughs>
in the city and how he thought about public space than trying to tell the whole of his life in this novel. I think for Andrew Haswell Green, a public space like Central Park was kind of a way to be alone without feeling alone, mm -hmm. to be in, in solitude um, while experiencing the comfort of other passing lives. And I think that's what writing does for me and what reading can do to books at their best offer that, um, that feeling of being invisibly accompanied in your in your loneliest moments so that sort of spoke to me a little bit I think. Why do you think he has not been remembered? I have a theory but I want to hear your theory first. I wish I could hear your theory first. I, I, th I think he wasn't a great self-publicist. Um, he was uh, quite a solitary man. I've said before that if he had a dating profile I think it would probably say something along the lines of if you hang around for a decade, I might eventually get used to you. <laughs> Whereas the profile of someone like Robert Moses, another creator of modern New York, who we talked about when I was on the show last time, would probably be something more like, you will love me to death, you know, and I'm a great tennis player and my parents love me too. Um, there was a sense with Andrew Haswell Green that he he was not a great self-promoter and maybe that's partly why his name hasn't lasted in quite the same way. My theory is it's because he didn't have children. He didn't have family. He didn't have caretakers of the family name and the legacy. So there was no one to tell his story. I th I th yeah, I think there is a line at, towards the end of the book, which my publicist reminded me of where I say that what you need at the end is love and a good publicist. And, uh, <laughs> I think that's true. I think that no one survived him who was able to speak to his memory. I think that's true too. What did you do to get that sense of his sort of salty, prickly, kind of funny personality? What part of the research led you to that profile of him? I loved reading his letters. I was uh, I was very lucky to get this sort of treasure trove of documents at the New York Historical Society. The New York Public Library was also a great resource. And it, I was able to open boxes of his diaries and letters that hadn't been opened for 17 years. And in there, I really got a sense of him, you know, speaking to others and then in his diaries, speaking to himself or perhaps to posterity. And it was so interesting to me seeing his voice change across the decades because he did live for 83 years and getting a sense of when he was prickly and the kinds of things that made him prickly and distant. And then moments where he was really vulnerable and you know wounded about his relationship with his father, for instance. And so I tried to capture some of those different tones within the book because I think we are all made of sort of different versions of ourselves and different voices. I wanna ask about, I wanna talk about Samuel Tilden for a little bit, 25th governor of New York, almost the president of the United States, except for Rutherford B. Hayes, <laughs> snatched it away from him. Uh, he seemed like the person that Andrew Haswell Green loved, that there was real love between these two men. What do we know about their real, real relationship in real life? I think you're right. I think they loved each other in some form. I, I don't label their love in the book, but I, I did want to try and capture the complexity of that specific in relationship between two individuals as I found it. And in, in my view, from looking at the diaries and, and, and letters and other people, accounts it was probably an unconsummated relationship in the physical sense but was more than platonic they were the sort of central emotional event of one another's lives um, and the rumors at, at the time that they were in some kind of physical relationship were were sort of rife but it's interesting it, it's been said that both of them would have had more successful careers and that perhaps Tilden would have won the presidency if he had had a wife at his side or children. Um, I don't know whether that is true, but what mattered to me was trying to capture the, the nuanced ups and downs of their complex, productive and sometimes infuriating friendship as I, as I found it. 
in one of the scenes, one of the pivotal scenes when Andrew meets Samuel Tilton for the first time, uh, this is from the book, immediately uh, Samuel's presence makes him very nervous. You write, and this is on page 69, his throat felt tight, he couldn't stop swallowing. On page 90, thoughts were fighting for supremacy in Andrew's head, but it seemed no clear winner wanted to emerge into speech. He felt sweat trickle down the collar of his shirt. The lights in the store suddenly seemed too bright. What was it about Samuel Tilden from you as a writer creating this relationship that caused such a physical reaction in Andrew? And why did you want it to be a physical reaction? I think I think he's a very charismatic individual, Samuel Tilden, but I think there's also a lot of class issues that come into play. You've got to remember, you know, as, as you all know from the book, that Andrew Haswell Green was born into a family that had once had some status, but had kind of fallen on hard times and into debt. And he arrived in New York age 15 as an apprentice boy at a general store with nothing. And he writes in his diaries of being very self-conscious about the thinness of his souls and people noticing them. And Samuel Tilden, by contrast, sort of walks into his life and is this young lawyer from an esteemed family who knows New York's most powerful people. And I think there's, there's a sense in which, you know, Andrew looked up to him, uh, wanted to be him, um, but also it was more complicated than that in various ways. And I think there was some envy in that friendship and a certain amount of distrust at various times, but ultimately they were together. They were friends again at the time of Samuel Tilden's death. Yeah, the narration goes on to say, Andrew was feeling something he'd not felt before. He barely got any chances was the thing. He knew with every second of dumb hesitation that accumulated within him that he was wasting an opportunity, which was all the more precious for being rare. It was a cruelty, really, that those people well practiced in the art of taking opportunities were the ones who had vastly more opportunities to rehearse the taking of them. What, aside from any sort of feelings he has, what opportunity does Andrew see in Samuel Tilden? I think he sees an opportunity to have the life that he, he, he has started to dream of having. He writes in his diaries a lot about wanting to be a gentleman and to be taken seriously as a gentleman, but also wanting to contribute to the public good in some way. And when he arrived in New York, age 15, you know, he wanted to read and he wanted to walk. And he found that he, he couldn't find books to read because all of the libraries were private mm -hmm. and they were too expensive for him to, to afford. And he couldn't really walk anywhere safely because the safe spaces to walk in the city at that time were the ticketed pleasure gardens, which he also couldn't afford. So I think he was looking for opportunities to learn and opportunities to create a space in which he could exist. And it's interesting thinking about fast forwarding several decades to him playing a key role in the creation of the New York Public Library in Central Park. He, he really did make the New York that he felt was missing when he arrived there as a boy. Everybody watching, if you'd like to ask a question, remember you can put it in the chat feature in YouTube or you can go to our Instagram page at all of it WNYC and pose a question there. We'll get to your questions in about 10 more minutes. A formative, if not difficult relationship Andrew had was with his father. How did that, in my opinion, dysfunctional relationship, not particularly loving relationship, fuel Andrew Haswell Green? I think it spurred him on in a number of ways and, and, and people who have complicated relationships with their parents will probably find different facets of that in the book, I think. I think he wanted to prove his father wrong. His father singled him out for special attention, but not in a good way, I think we could say. Um, he felt that, you know, he, his work on the farm wasn't manly enough and, and so forth. I think that in later life, Andrew Haswell Green associated his father with big open green spaces, and that's an interesting thing. Uh, I think he created things in later life that he felt that his father might be proud of in some way. And I think he was very conscious too, 
of his own history and collective histories in New York City. Uh, you know, I think he he found in places like Central Park fascinating containers for our history, but also these uncanny foretellers of our future too, our barometers of our burdens and delusions. And he knew that um, he was ahead of his time in terms of things like wanting there to be clean air for everyone <laughs> to breathe. What is the moment in the book that Andrew Haswell Green realizes, he starts to actually believe in himself and that he can accomplish big things. And I'm curious as a writer, how did you build up to that moment? I think the one moment in, in, in the book that was interesting to me in the research was when it seemed like he sort of stepped outside his own earnestness and did a sort of canny trick on Samuel Tilden, on his friend. And, and maybe you remember the bit where there's been a card game and Samuel Tilden has lost some money and Andrew steps up and says that he's gonna, he's gonna find a way to get that money back for Samuel. And the methods he uses are not quite evocative of William Boss Tweed, the great corrupt <laughs> official in New York, but have an element of pragmatism and canniness that I, I suspect surprised even him. And I think when he found that he was able to impress someone like Samuel instead of being in awe of him the whole time, he, he was able to sort of move on in his life. And as a writer, I think that you don't want to lean on those moments too hard, but they're there in all their small specific detail and hopefully people find something in them. Oh no, those are good moments because they're the ones that kind of grab you by the collar a little mm -hmm. bit and you say, oh, things are going to be different from this moment on as I continue to read this book. Let me yeah. settle in. This is going to be a little bit of a ride. Let's go. Uh, this is an interesting passage from the novel. Green thinks, it was very easy to achieve nothing in life if one succumbed always to whims. The whim of the moment of the day, the whim of the season, the whim of the year, whims had consequences. They came at a cost. How does he learn this lesson to avoid whims? I think that I think that in his childhood, he felt like he followed impulses. There's, you know, one particular scene that readers will perhaps remember where he's hanging out with a childhood friend and they drink some wine and it's one of the first times he's ever drunk alcohol and the friends get a little close and you know that's that's based around um a moment uh in my research that i discovered where it seemed seemed like this sort of humiliation had occurred to him with a friend and it was it was difficult to pin down in terms of exactly what happened but it stayed with him and i, I think that for someone like Andrew Haswell Green, there was this feeling of restraint that followed him through his life. And it was a thing that he admired in himself to some extent, but came to regret, I think, towards the end when he felt that he, he had perhaps not been loved or, or loved in the way that he perhaps would have dreamt of. There's a detail I think it's early in the book where we learn that um, he picks up trash off the street, that people <laughs> on the street. Is that a detail from your imagination or did you find that detail somewhere? It was useful. I confess that's a detail from my imagination. And, you know, when I, when I started to picture his last days uh, and his last hours on Park Avenue, he, he did write in his diaries about, being very distressed by, by what we would now call the littering habits of people walking down the street. But it seemed to me such a beautiful image of his fastidiousness and his desire to focus on the small things and give the mundane its beautiful due and try to, try to clean the city around him. And, um, and I think he was obsessive about things like that. And at the same time, of course, He's very distressed about the skyline that was coming up in New York. What we think of as the iconic skyline he wrote in his diaries was a mess of buildings speaking to, to each other in barely coherent argument. I want to talk a little bit about race in the novel because obviously the man who murders him is a black man. 
Central Park to make Central Park Seneca Village, had to be raised, the Black community. Mm -hmm. He spent time in Trinidad and he saw what conditions were like there. Um, and then we'll get to Hannah Elias in a minute. How does race play a role in this story? One of the things I was looking at in the book is, is just the ways that history pushes to the margins anyone who doesn't conform. <laughs> and to some extent that's green, I think, and to an even greater extent, of course, that is people of color like Cornelian, Cornelius Williams, the, the man who shot green and received no understanding or support in his life before or after that moment. Uh, he clearly had some, what we would now term mental health issues and, and received no help. And then there's Bessie Davis, as you say, who in The Great Mistake is said to have become the wealthiest black woman in New York, but who really had to accept some tremendous mistreatment from the most powerful elements of white male society in 19th century New York to, to, get, to get there, to get anything. So Hannah Elias, she's fascinating because you introduce her as Bessie Davis, also known as Hannah Elias, the witch, the goddess, the great pleasurer, the servicer of church bells and gentlemen flap doodles and foozlers, the monsters, the red bags, evil whore, glorious queen, the most beautiful one, the rich negress, Cleopatra, the hedge creeper, and various other names. Okay, so after I read that, of course, I went down a Google rabbit hole. And your book and the New York Times uh, machine, the, the Wayback Machine that you can go into is fantastic. Yeah because I found an article about her from 1904, and it says, Hannah Elias locked in the house at 236 Central Park West, which John R. Platt declares she bought with money wrung from him, yesterday successfully divide, defied the civil order for her arrest issued by Justice Durgro of the Supreme Court. What led me that was the address you use. I kept typing that in and her name or various names to find I got that article. What do we know about her real life? It's funny, one of, one of, the, um, one of the reviewers of, of The Great Mistake, I'm trying to remember which publication it was, got in touch with me after reviewing the book because her parents had lived at that exact same address okay. much, much later. Um, but yeah, B Bessie Davis was fascinating to re research. Uh, she was also known as Hannah Elias. Uh, I too enjoyed going down the New York Times uh, time machine rabbit hole and reading all the articles about her. She was, um, you know, as, as you read from the book, she, she was given all of these names by different people, but she remained somewhat enigmatic. She became the, the center of the murder investigation after Green was shot dead on Park Avenue um, because the man who killed him uh, said he did so because he was in love with Bessie Davis, also known as Hannah Elias. And she came from nothing. Uh, she was briefly imprisoned for borrowing uh, a dress uh, for, for a special event with her family from the white family that she, she worked for. And then the historical record sort of uh, goes fuzzy for her for, for many years. And then she starts to pop up again as the, the owner of this uptown mansion in Manhattan that she said satisfied the needs of gentlemen of the higher sort. And a lot of New York's leading politicians appear to have visited her. She became, you know, through her through her work, um, a holder of, of many sort of incendiary private secrets. Let's get to some audience questions. This is from Jonathan. Was there any particular inspiration for this? Thanks for such a fascinating book. This was an engrossing read. It's the park bench story, right? It is, it's the park bench story, really. I, I probably wouldn't have written the book if I hadn't been taking a walk in Central Park in the summer of 2012. And, you know, I'd gone through Glen's Ban Arch and along Montaigne's Rivulet, one of New York's original streams. And I saw these little shaded stone steps going up to my right. And I thought, well, that's that's somewhere I haven't walked before. And, and at the top of those steps, uh, surrounded by the shade of, of five trees, which I later found out were there to represent the boroughs, was this bench dedicated to this guy called Andrew Haswell Green. And uh, I've always been fascinated by park benches, by, you know, public 
storytelling in all its different forms and I, I started to look into his life. This is from Rockaway Valley. Does the title have more than one meaning? Did Green think of himself as a mistake or obviously his murder was a mistake? Yes, I think the title does. I'm terrible at coming up with titles is the first thing to confess. I think The Great Mistake may be the only working title I've ever come up with that has stuck for, for a project. Um, in my first couple of years of research, I came across a New York Times clipping referring to the merger of New York with Brooklyn, um, another thing that Green envisaged and made into reality, as the great mistake of 1898. And I, I printed that out from the archive and I had it on the wall by my desk and I suddenly just sort of started referring to the, the Word document that I was playing around in as the great mistake. And, you know, more than that, as I researched his life, I found a person who was obsessed with the eradication of errors and haunted by his own real or imagined missteps. And I was also finishing this novel in the thick of the Trump years. And, you know, one thing led to another and the great mistake felt about right in the end. This is from Anonymous. I love how you use the Central Park gates as chapter titling device. How do we find a list of them and their locations? How did you come up with that as a device and where can we send this person to find more information? Well, um, there are some good resources on the internet that, that, <laughs> list, that list all of the gate names. There are 20 of them in all. Um, and each chapter of the book is, is named after one of the gates. But they're very interesting because they, you know, that they, they are not, most of them are not physical gates in any sense. They are just names that were attributed at the time and are sort of invisible lines across which you walk into the park. And many people at the time wanted each of the gates to be named after wealthy contributors. There was, you know, it was in the tradition of patronage at the time. And it was Andrew Haswell Green, among others, who really felt that the gates should be named after the working people of the city. Um, and so there's Mariner's Gate, there's Woodman's Gate, um, there's, there's also Boy's Gate and Girl's Gate. And I, I found that there was a wonderful sort of poetry to those names. And so I wanted to use them as entry points onto his life and the different chapters. Um, but of course, naming is as imperfect as any endeavor. There's, uh, there's no therapist's gate or, or gym instructor's gate or, or anything like that. Just you wait, there'll be a Peloton gate. It'll happen. It's, it's coming. Surely the Peloton okay. gate is coming. We have a, our book club. We hold it on Instagram in between these conversations and we pose these questions. Uh, and one of the most entertaining asides in the novel is the story of Inspector McCluskey narrating about an elephant who was brought to the police station uh, only to almost trample everyone there. And we asked our listeners where they thought the story was real or imagined. 65% thought it was real. Oh, excuse me, 4% thought it was real. 36% said, no, that's fake. 64% real, 36% no. What's the verdict? I think this is one of those rare examples when the majority is correct. <laughs> Topsy was a female elephant who was electrocuted at Coney Island uh, in January of 1903, I think. Um, she was part of a herd of performing elephants at a circus and she gained this reputation as a bad elephant after a spectator died in, in 1902 and she was sold to Coney Island Sea Lion Park and uh, got involved in various sort of well-publicized incidents, which actually looking back can be attributed to the fact that her handler was a complete drunk. But on January the 4th, 1903, in front of a small crowd of, of invited reporters and guests, Topsy the Elephant was fed carrots laced with potassium cyanide and electrocuted and strangled also. And electrocution was the final cause of death. And, uh, it was actually the first filmed animal death. Um, it's it's a pretty horrifying story, but it is, yes, a real one. That went dark. That went dark. 
I have another question for you from Miles. Can you recommend any good books about Tilden? Did you read any as part of your research? I did. There were there were lots of good uh, books about Tilden, and actually one of the most fascinating things, like in the end, I would find um, the, re the the materials that were as con contemporaneous as possible to be the most useful, and he left behind you know some version of what we would now call memoirs and that was really fascinating he also you know it was very popular at the time to have a friend a friendly friend um write write a book about you and john bigelow who was also a founder of the new york public library uh, wrote quite a lot about samuel tilden that was that you can that you can read from the time and i i found that sort of material in newspaper articles in a sense more useful than 20th century material that was looking back through through the mists of, of hindsight like I wanted to read the material from the time whenever I could. Now Inspector McCloskey was a real person but you had to give him a personality? I did <laughs> it is it is he was a very interesting guy to research and and reinvent uh, some of the characters in the book all of which are based on real people, there was a ton of information for. Not a ton of information about Inspector McCluskey, but a couple of things that unlocked him for me were, were references to him single-handedly rounding up crooks in the Tenderloin district of New York on St. Patrick's Day and throwing them in the back of his van, which led various early, um, early sort of organized crime people to flee New York City completely in fear of this of this man, Inspector McCluskey. And then the other small newspaper reference that sort of set his character alive for me was of him being an elephant sympathizer because he had stood up for Topsy the elephant, um, as, as people should have. <laughs> People didn't know the name Andrew Haswell Green. People didn't know about Inspector McCloskey or Betty Davis, but there is a name, Bessie Davis, excuse me. Boss Tweed, everybody knows about Boss Tweed. Even if you don't live in New York City, you learn about Boss Tweed <laughs> in history class, but he doesn't really appear toward, until the end of the novel. Why? I think I wanted to focus on some of the characters who've been pushed to the margins of history, the, the people who, um, the people whose lives posterity has at times preferred not to record. And, you know, that can apply to Andrew Haswell Green, it applies to an even greater extent to, to people like Cornelius Williams. But Tweed did keep popping up because one of the things that Andrew Haswell Green managed to do with Samuel Tilden in his lifetime was get Tweed locked up. He was sort of involved behind the scenes in the seizing of those um, ledgers and the, the New York Times coverage that, that eventually followed. And, you know, Tweed gives one speech in the, in the book, which is pretty close to a speech he actually gave in the 1850s, in which he talks essentially about, you know, making New York great again. And um, I, I I don't believe that history repeats itself endlessly. I think there is progress along the way, but certainly there are ghosts of the past in our present. And at times I'm tempted to believe in reincarnation and, and that, that speech from Tweed really just grabbed me by the throat. So I wanted to include it in the book. That is what you meant when you came on our radio show to preview the book. We always ask the author, is there something you want people to pay special attention to? Something that was really meaningful or that really has stuck with you in writing the book? And you said the speech by Tweed. That's what you told us a month ago. Is it because of, of this idea of history repeating itself? It was, yeah. That's, that's what I had in mind, although uh, I didn't anticipate that that more people would be interested in the elephant, but it makes total sense now that everyone is an elephant sympathizer. I, I am too. What do you hope, how do you hope Green is remembered by future generations? I hope that he, I hope that he's remembered as someone who, you know, 
he, he felt that we lived in a world that sometimes to our detriment is obsessed with the individual over the collective and the private concern over the public one and selfishness over the selfless and short-term thinking over long-term thinking. And he was a person who worked against that philosophy, I think, um, which you may or may not think is still prevalent today. And in 19th century New York, he believed in public space, in public health, in public education, in supporting the arts. And he foresaw too that polluting the environment often hits the poorest hardest. He saw that sometimes your best first chance at a somewhat more equal society may be to create clean air and to think about um, the ways that people live their daily li lives. And I, I, think, I think he would like to be remembered for that public work, for being a genuine publicist in the oldest sense of the word. It was such a fun read. I can't wait to read it again and just Google everything. I read it, I, I broke down with Bessie Davis and started Googling, but it was such a fun read. I learned so much. I can't wait to read it again and learn a little bit more. Jonathan Lee, thank you so much for being our Get Lit author this month. And we all really enjoyed The Great Mistake. Thanks so much, Alison. Well, since Andrew Haswell Green was the man behind Central Park, we thought we'd stick with the park theme, only head a little bit south to Tompkins Square Park, because over the summer, the band Pink Loud performed concerts there, so they sort of impromptu concerts. They soon became East Village staples over the summer. They performed multiple shows a week. Gotham has reported that one Tompkins Park regular said Pink, Cloud, Pink Loud saved the summer. So our musical guest tonight is Cloudy, lead singer, band, linger, band leader of Pink Louds with the song Soul in My Body and then we'll talk to Cloudy on the other side. Little girl should tell me I got soul She sees it all and I sing
And joining me now is the band leader of Pink Louds, Cloudy. Welcome. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Going great. So let's go back to the beginning of the shows in Tompkins Square Park. When did they start? Why did they start? What was the spirit of it? So uh, we were in the, you know, uh, in the intense month, the intenser months of the pandemic. I know we're still in it. Uh, so yeah, you know, like most musicians, I was playing a lot at home, doing a lot of Instagram lives and Zoom and all that which is not as fulfilling as I wish it was. And, um, and I, I've been busking uh, my whole life. Busking means playing on the street and subway stations. Uh, I mean, for a, lot, for a lot of my life. And came June, it kind of felt like it was okay to do it. It was safe enough as long as people were socially distancing. I bought a wagon so that I could like carry my things to you know different parts of the city and explore. I'm... I, I, I love this city with all my heart. And, and, and the more I can know about it, the, the better. So I'm, I'm really honored to be on this show uh, and, and with that, uh, with the book that we just uh, talked about earlier. So that was great. And, you know, one of the first days I found Tompkins Square Park, I'd always known about it. I'd been there before, but I'd never tried playing there. And just automatically, it, it just, it was so beautiful. People really seemed to appreciate what I was doing. Um, I kept playing and playing because people wanted more and they would bring me uh, water and, um, you know, beer and just, you know, it was, it was so nice. And uh, next weekend I brought the band and then it just, you know, it just grew from there. People started coming to our shows where the word spread and um, that's how it happened. And I understand it grew beyond just music. It sort of became 3D multimedia. Who else came aboard as part of the shows? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think the people uh, who are usually in the park are also part of the experience and mm -hmm. people really started dancing. We would do dance contests. We would do costume contests sometimes. Um, we really wanted to, you know, to me, it's a lot more fun if people join in. I mean, that makes the experience mm -hmm. different every time. You know, we might not be doing a completely different show each time, but people make it a new experience. And if you can really connect with, with other humans and feed off of them and what they're doing, it's always gonna be different. And we had some puppeteers who joined in, some who we'd worked with before, others who were new, a lot of dancers. We made a, a music video where we pretty much collaged a lot of the dancers from the park. And this, this goes from like four-year-old kids to, you know, 80-year-old uh, women and, uh, you know, all kinds of, it's Tompkins Square Park, it's New York City. It's to me, it's as New York City as it gets. Um, so, so yeah, it was definitely a, a full experience. I'm curious about your fan base. When we announced, I was in the studio when we announced that you were going to be the musical guest, and one of our most serious, sober, hardcore reporters ran saying, I love Pink Louds. <laughs> like her head exploded when we said you were going to be the guest. Um, I'm really curious about your fan base. Have you noticed a change since the since the park performances? Um, sure. Uh, yes, I think the biggest change. I mean, we've always had this word of mouth thing going because we perform a lot on the street, or especially I, I have. Um, and since we've been to the park, I mean, I'm not sure if this is what you'd be referring to, but definitely we've had a lot more teenagers uh, coming to our shows, um, and that's been a great thing. And I think it's mostly because venues in New York City are, are usually 21 plus and it just opened up a whole world for us uh, you know of all these kids that usually can't get into bars can't get into venues and to me that's part of the magic of playing outdoors playing you know in public spaces that you really get to all kinds of people and ages and backgrounds even you know even in New York City venues you know um, most of the time the people who will go to our one of our shows even if our audience is pretty diverse it's gonna be, you know, more or less in the 20s to 30 year olds, you know, kind of indie rock, whatever, uh, that kind of audience, which is great. But it's, it's to me, it's so, so amazing to be able to play for all kinds of people because that's what I came to New York City to do. It's so interesting to hear you say that because I started thinking about what Jonathan Lee said about Andrew Haswell Green, that he wanted the parks to be for everybody. He wanted the libraries to be for everybody. He wanted everybody to partake and enjoy what the city has to offer creatively and in terms of uh, energy and things that were only available to a few now could be available to many. 
and that's a little bit what you're talking about with with playing in the park absolutely absolutely yeah uh and i, and I wouldn't change that for for anything to me it's the most beautiful experience yeah now your song lyrics can be really funny there's a there's one particular song about um getting your air conditioner fixed yeah <laughs> Do you just tend to write from life or how do oh, you get oh, inspired? Yeah. I'm from Puerto Rico uh, and uh, I grew up without air conditioning. Uh, my, my parents didn't really believe in, in air conditioning or, or TV or many things which I am very grateful for, but I did spend a lot of very, very hot summers and Puerto Rico summer all year around. So, um, mm -hmm. so I would literally go to the supermarket, which is something that it says in the song, uh, to the supermarket just to be able to breathe. And uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> on your album, sometimes you sample street sounds and you incorporate them into your songs. What do you like about layering in the sounds of the city? Um, to me, uh, I, I like music to be a, a visual experience. That's why a lot of our shows, you know, have kind of a theatrical thing to them but I want for when people to listen listen to an album to be able to also you know really visualize things and it, it gives you a little bit more I don't know it gives a certain complexity to the emotion that, that the music can already bring um, and you know there's so many artists uh, who have you know who influenced me in this uh, you know like Yankee Hotel Foxtrot the Wilco album or you mm -hmm. know albums by by the Beatles you know there, there's so many uh, people who've done things like this and it's just to me, I, I always want an album to be an experience. And a lot of times I use these, so these sounds to transition uh, one song to the next, uh, and it, it just to make it a, a voyage, you know. Pink Clouds were planning to tour Mexico before the pandemic. Obviously you couldn't do that, but then you had on the other end of the spectrum these hugely successful shows in Tompkins Square Park. Have your goals changed? as a band now i mean i'd still love to go to mexico for sure <laughs> <laughs> that that hasn't changed at all um but i definitely you know i think for, for there was a time when you know you i would busk a lot on the street but obviously as an artist you're you know you're also trying to be able to perform in better venues and you know maybe you get picked up by a label or you know things like that uh even though i've always really appreciated playing on the street but now it's become almost a thing where i I so I, I prefer to play at Tompkins Square Park. It's oh, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I it's just so joyous, and I meet so many wonderful people every time, and I hear so many great stories. And yeah, you know, it's people that if you're like walking down the street, you're not going to necessarily meet these people, but because you, you don't say hello and strike up a conversation with everyone, and there's so many wonderful people. But when you play music and you're able to, you know, take breaks and between sets, you know, people come to talk to you and and you make friends, and it's just. And it's so wonderful. And, you know, especially while it's summer, not now that winter's coming, then uh, it's going to be a little bit miserable. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, it, it's definitely changed that. It's my favorite place to play. We got a question for you, unsolicited. Okay. Where did Cloudy steal that subway map from? Ha. <laughs> um, I got, you know, they, they don't have those in the subway stations anymore and they were taking it down. This was right before the pandemic. They were taking it down and I asked uh, the, the man uh, working for the MTA if I could have it. Uh, it was kind of torn, but I, I took it. And a week later, I found a big traffic light, which inspired me to write a song called Semaforo, which means tra traffic light in uh, Spanish. And that's how the pandemic, uh, because it was about like how the traffic lights were still working while everyone else was in their house, the machines kept on doing their thing. So it was like a nice coincidence that I was able to like fill my house with the street, which I was going to miss so much for a few months during the pandemic, you know, the, during the first months. We got another comment from YouTube. I'm huge on death metal and punk rock, pink louds rules. <laughs> so there you go. The answer is maybe. <laughs> first of all thank you so much for saving the summer and doing what you did and being there for your fellow new yorkers in the park and bringing some joy during a not so joyful time thank you for being with us tonight and i would love to know we're going to go out in the song last chance at love can you tell us a little bit about it before we play it Sure. Um, it's the first uh, the first song um, that I wrote uh, with this project, uh, Pink Clouds, and it's it's really the song that kind of like put me in the in the place or, you know, whatever spirit uh, energy that I was channeling to 
to create this project and it just took me like that that song just kind of like fell from wherever and it, and it hit me and I made it and I just kept on going with that energy so I felt that it was a good song to to play for the program it's it's a song about being heartbroken and uh Pink Clouds is really about taking heartbreak and you know really swimming in it you know like really you know diving into it and coming out and celebrating life uh, because sadness is part of life and we believe in, in that and just really living. Cloudy, thank you so much for being with us. This is Last Chance at Love. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.
thanks so much to Claudia of Pink Clouds for, for, for performing tonight. And of course, thank you to Jonathan Lee, author of The Great Mistake, for being our September Get Lit With All Of It book club author. We have our October book ready to announce it. But first, a couple of thank yous. We have to say thank you to our partners, the New York Public Library, who get those e-copies into New Yorkers' hands or at least onto their devices every month. That's Brian Bannon, Tony Marks, and Andrew Medler. Thank you so much. Also, thanks to the folks at The Green Space who produce this and make it look so great. That's Jennifer Ricardo, David Utsky, and Emma. And finally, to the Get Lit team, the producers who make this happen every month. That's Megan Ryan, Jordan Loft, and Simon Close. Okay, to our October Get Lit with All of It announcement. Our next author was just nominated for a National Book Award. Her novel is just out, already a New York Times bestseller. We're going to be reading The Matrix by Lauren Groff. Of course, you might remember Lauren from Fates and Furies about a portrait of a marriage. In her latest novel, Lauren takes her readers away from the present all the way back to 12th century England. The story follows 17-year-old Marie de France, a real-life poet from this period who is cast out of a court. She is sent to be a new pri to the new prioress of an abbey on the brink of ruin. Marie finds love and fulfillment in her new role and sisterhood and becomes determined not only to protect the women she leads from some of the villainous men around them, but to chart a new course for women across Europe. The Washington Post says, in Lauren Groff's hands, the tale of a medieval nunnery is must read fiction. New Yorkers, head to wnyc.org slash get lit to find out how to borrow a free e-copy of The Matrix from our partners, the New York Public Library, or you can always pick up a copy from your local indie bookseller. Here's the date. I'm a dork. See, I put it on the side of the book so I don't forget. Mark your calendars for Wednesday, October 27th at 7 p.m. That's when we'll be hosting our virtual Get Lit With All Of It book club event with Lauren Groff and a special musical guest to be announced. In the meantime, follow us on Instagram. That's where we hold the book club in between these events. Our Instagram handle is at all of it WNYC. That's at all of it WNYC. You'll be on top of any discussions and any updates on the events. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Allison Stewart. I will see you on the radio and happy reading. <laughs>